it's really interesting when we think about the dynasties in baseball, the, the teams that had a long history of success, they all had really good pitching. Now, if we think about the recent dynasties, like the Astros have gone on this great run recently, and they had Verlander and Granke and others, right? We go back a little bit to the Red Sox and their run for a few years, and they had the Schillings, and they had the Pedro Martinez's of the world and others. Go back before that, and you know, the Yankees had these clutch pitchers that were, you know, anywhere from Mucina to Pettit to Clemens to Kevin Brown and Randy Johnson. And even before that, when I was a kid, I mean, we think about the Braves, right? We got Glavin and Maddox and Smoltz and Avery, right? Well, if we go back to the golden era of baseball, it was the same thing. You know, we think of, to me, I think of the golden age of baseball as the 1950s. And the 1950s had all of those players like Clemente and Mantle and Mays and Aaron and Banks and, and so many others. And the teams that were successful had the pitching. The Yankees had a great run during the 50s. And they had a key dominant pitcher. The Dodgers were extremely successful. And they had really two dominant pitchers. And you could even make the argument that there were more. After that, in the 60s, the, the, the Cardinals had an ace on their staff. So pitching has always been such an important part of success in baseball. Yet when we talk about collecting cards from the 50s, we tend to talk about the big hitters. We tend to talk about the guys like Aaron and Mays and Mantle and Clemente. And we sometimes don't really think about the pitching. But again, success really needs pitching. So who were the key pitchers during the golden age of baseball, during the 1950s and early 60s. Who were the players that had the outstanding arms that led their team to success? Well, believe it or not, there weren't that many of them. If you look at the 1950s and you think about who are the best pitchers, whose rookie cards, who has rookie cards? What pitchers have rookie cards from the 1950s that are Hall of Fame pitchers? And think about it for a second. I bet you can't name more than, well, some of you can, but a lot of people can't name more than two or three. And some really good pitchers came out of the era, but there weren't that many dominant Hall of Fame pitchers whose rookie cards are in the 1950s. So if it's so rare, if there are so few, it seems like they should be more valuable, right? If there's just a handful of them, if there's just a handful of pitchers from the 1950s, from this entire decade, who have rookie cards from the 1950s, if it's rare to have an elite pitcher from that period, Shouldn't those dominant pitchers carry a premium? But instead, it seems like they're super affordable. So who are some of those Hall of Fame pitchers with rookie cards from the 1950s? Because almost all of them are severely undervalued. And I wonder, with as few as there were, shouldn't they have extra value, not less? Let's take a look at the list of pitchers that were dominating pitchers that were Hall of Fame pitchers with rookie cards from the 1950s. It's sort of like when you think about quarterbacks, like in order to be a Super Bowl winning team, you have to have an elite quarterback. Well, in order to be a dynasty 
in baseball, you need pitching. And, you know, I was thinking about it. Well, who are the rookie cards from the 1950s of pitchers, of some of these elite pitchers? Now, there's several that are in 48 and 49, but in the 50s, there are fewer. So the first one up, 10-time All-Star. Look at that win-loss record. Career ERA of 2.75. Won six World Series, and that might be the the key tip there. Three-time AL wins leader, two-time MLB ERA leader, won a Cy Young, and won a World Series MVP. A lot of you could probably figure out that that is Whitey Ford. And I've talked about Whitey Ford before, but why isn't his card worth way more? Look at his rookie cards. That one right there is a really nice looking card. Super affordable. When you compare this to some of the other hitters, what, why aren't pitchers worth more? Look at that win-loss record. That's unbelievable. And I just went off the top of my head. I said, who are some of the rookie cards? And I'm sure I'm going to forget one or two. Let me know who they are, by the way. But this next guy is an eight-time All-Star. Won a World Series. Again, the, the common theme is that they win World Series. These are the dominant pitchers from the decade. A two-time ERA leader, 2.52 career ERA, 228 career saves. We didn't really have relievers back in the 50s. Hoyt Wilhelm is another Hall of Fame pitcher rookie card from the 1950s. Might be the worst picture of any Hall of Fame rookie card. Now, this one's an expensive one because it's a high number from the 52 set, and it's a rookie card of a Hall of Famer. So this one is inflated in value. But, I mean, compare that to Whitey Ford. The price is insane. But again, it's because of the demand, because of the set, because it's a high number. All right, the next guy that I'm thinking of is a seven-time All-Star, 165 and 87 win-loss record. Now that is going to tip it off for a lot of us. 2.76 career ERA, four-time World Series champion, two-time World Series MVP, three-time Cy Young Award. So we're not just in World Series here. We're winning MVP awards and multiple-time ERA leader and multiple-time MLB win leader and multiple time strikeout leader. Now, this is the one rookie card that really seems to be expensive from this decade of a pitcher, and deservedly so. Arguably the best pitcher of all time. He's certainly in the discussion. Sandy Koufax. So, Sandy Koufax is expensive. And I'm not saying Whitey Ford is Sandy Koufax. But look at Sandy Koufax's rookie card. I mean, it's significantly more expensive. So, again, the Hoyt Wilhelm, because it's a high number, it's a 52. The price is a little nutty. And Koufax is really expensive. But, again, there are not that many aces with rookie cards from the 1950s. There just aren't. And again, I'm just thinking off the top of my head for this list right here. This next guy's a nine-time All-Star, won an AL win leader, three-time strikeout leader, so a strikeout pitcher. I mean, nine All-Stars for a pitcher is quite a few. Look at that career ERA, low threes. So this is, again... A low ERA guy, a high strikeout guy, a lot of wins, almost 3,000 strikeouts. Now, this one is a little bit harder. And one of the reasons it's harder is because he's not like a first or second ballot Hall of Famer. But Jim Bunning's rookie card in that 57 set is really cheap. Now, in a decade where there's just a handful of Hall of Fame pitchers, doesn't it seem like one of them should be expensive? 
I mean, look at the grade of this one for $170, and the other one's under $100. Those are really nice examples of one of the very few Hall of Fame pitchers with rookie cards in the 1950s. Why is it so cheap? It's it's not like there were 50 of them. It's not like there were 50 Hall of Fame pitchers with rookie cards during this decade. The next one, again, a nine-time All-Star, again, a World Series champ, won a Cy Young, won an MLB win leader title, three times was the MLB strikeout leader. So again, there's just a few pitchers from this stretch that were dominating. 2,500 strikeouts below 3.0 ERA. I mean, that's a really low ERA. And Don Drysdale. I, now, the other thing about the Don Drysdale rookie card is it's an awesome picture. He's such a it's such a young picture, such a great picture. They've got the B up there on the hat, which is awesome. Why is Don Drysdale so cheap? I've mentioned Don Drysdale before. Why is he so cheap? And when he's one of the only pitchers from an entire decade with a rookie card and in the Hall of Fame, doesn't it seem like it should be way more expensive? Again, if there were 30 pitchers in the Hall of Fame from this decade with rookie cards, I would understand it, but there aren't. The next one's a nine-time All-Star, again a World Series champ. That's the common theme. These few pitchers were winning all the World Series during this time. NL MVP, that's probably a giveaway. Two-time Cy Young Award, two-time World Series MVP. So he's pitching in the postseason and is dominating. Nine-time Gold Glover, won a win title, won an ERA title, won a strikeout title, and over 3,000 career strikeouts. Now, a lot of us probably are able to figure out which this one is. And his card is a high number. His rookie card is a high number, and it's still very affordable for one of the best pitchers of all time and one of the few pitchers in the Hall of Fame with a rookie card from the 50s. Bob Gibson. If I were to bat back in this time and there was one guy I didn't want to face, there's no doubt it's Bob Gibson. And look at his rookie card. Uh, To me, that seems really, really cheap for Bob Gibson. And it's a high number. I mean, one of the most dominating right-handed pitchers of all time. So again, first off, let me know who else is a pitcher from the 1950s with their rookie card, I should say, in the 1950s. Because there were some good ones in the late 40s, but there's just a few in the 50s. But Whitey Ford, super affordable. Hoyt Wilhelm, that's an anomaly because of the set and the high number. Koufax is the only one who is valued where he should be. Jim Bunning is crazy cheap. Don Drysdale is crazy cheap. Bob Gibson is crazy cheap for what he is. We value quarterbacks in football because you need them in order to win championships. Why don't we value pitching as far as cards go? The same way we value quarterback cards... For football, if you need a quarterback to win a title, deservedly, the cards are expensive, should be the same in baseball.